Welcome to this episode of Revolution and Ideology. In this episode, we're going to briefly talk about forced sterilization of non-white people in the United States. Uh, we're going to go, this could be a four-hour episode on the history of sort of eugenics and ethnic cleansing, etc. of indigenous peoples in the United States. But we are really motivated to do this episode because of the current events that are going on right now. Um, that are reportedly happening at ICE facilities. Um, unless you've been under a rock somehow, you've read the news that a woman by the name of Don Wooten in Georgia, who is a licensed nurse practitioner working in an ICE facility, the Irwin County Detention Center in Georgia, filed a whistleblower complaint that women were receiving hysterectomies basically against their will. And uh, this then was corroborated by women who were being held at that specific facility. And just recently, as of recording this, the Director of Immigration Services has ordered an expedited investigation into what is going on at that facility. But uh, I think we'd be fooling ourselves if we think it's only happening there. So we are really sort of motivated to talk about the historical context of this happening in the United States, because this isn't an isolated like 2020 issue. This has happened throughout the history of our country. Uh, so Jared's going to kick us off. So um, at this point, those of you that are familiar with our podcast know that we've already done a series. Well, we have not done a complete series, but we're about a quarter of a way through a series called Myth is America. And in Myth is America, we uncover um, the history of the United States. This is often not told through the lens of slaves or women or indigenous peoples. And we've done entire episodes on the horrors that indigenous peoples have faced since 1492 to include the Columbus colonization, to include Pontiac's Rebellion and the Rebellion of Tecumseh and King Philip's War. I'm going a little bit out of order, but we already have... Have, I guess what I'm trying to say here is normally I do a long history of indigenous um, um, oppression in this country um, in its founding era, but we've already done a lot of episodes that specifically highlight those. In fact, our next episode in that series that we'll do is the Trail of Tears one. Don't have time to go into all that right now because we want to get to this kind of like more modern day context, but I do just want to stress that, let me be blunt, the colonial process on these two continents has been a, a, a process of not just like, you know, like it's not just conquest. It is an attempt at ethnic cleansing. And that's what we're really driving at here. And it's been that way since 1492. And like I said, we have so much evidence leading up to this time period. It's impossible to ignore. Um, so I just kind of want to get that out of the way for those of you that might be looking forward for me to like, again, talk in depth about Trail of Tears or what took place um, during the Pequot Wars or something. We've already done those in their entire own episodes. So go back and look in our, our feed for those. Oh, anyway. we will. Like the Trail of Tears. Well, the Trail of Tears is coming up. I'm yeah. actually finishing up my research on that one right now. But anyway, um, okay. Moving forward, though, we want to talk about um, what happens after the quote-unquote West is won. So again, I, I'm unfortunately skipping out on so many events from basically uh, the Trail of Tears, 1830s through the 1860s and 70s and 80s. We will be doing episodes on those. We will. But for the purposes of this episode, and we want to do it right now, we're going to skip some of those. So basically, after the defeat of like the Geronimos of the world and the crazy horses of the world and so on and so forth, when the United States feels that it has basically successfully completed its manifest destiny, um, there are still um, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of indigenous people um, that are now kind of forced onto this reservation system. Um, and of course, we know that reservation system is based on conquest, broken treaties, etc., I mention this because what the United States decides in a more softer form um, now, apparently they're a little bit more enlightened in the late 1800s, rather than just all out war and full blown, um, like, yeah, slaughter in some cases, that they decide they're going to seek to assimilate indigenous peoples into basically white culture. And they're going to do this through programs in boarding schools. Um, but before we get into the boarding schools, there is an interesting conversation that we want to have regarding how language informs like ideological constructs and makes, to be blunt, us, and when I say us, all of us, because it's still happening now as we're finding out, okay with this form of, again, assimilation, if not outright ethnic cleansing. And so we're going to dive deep into an academic uh, article written by Katie Kane, I want to say in 1999. And yep. she, yes, in 1999, 
And this article is titled, Nits Make Lice, uh, Drogada, Sand Creek, and the Poetics of Colonial Extermination. And we assign it in, I assign it in, in, for one reason or another, in about three or four different types of classes that I teach. We assign it in our Ideologies and Isms course in it, it, when we're talking about racism. It is one of our favorite articles, and we feel compelled to like use it right now as we're having this conversation. Because uh, uh, Katie Kane, in this case, is really discussing how language makes us, and I already said it, okay with what's transpiring in our general context regarding these horrible acts. So um, if I want to like summarize it real quickly, essentially what she's saying, her thesis is that language informs ideology and ideology informs the way we think, the way we speak, obviously language and what we practice and how we rationalize that practice in the case of ethnic cleansing, or as she says, colonial extermination moving forward. And the title of her article is Inspired, Nits Make Lice, by a specific incident in 1864. And again, this this incident will get its own episode in Myth, uh, myth, uh, myth is America. But for right now, I'm just going to do a brief, like, real quick summary. It is the Sand Creek Massacre that took place just a couple hours from us in um, uh, southeastern Colorado. Yeah, it was actually just there like a month ago. We took yeah, our, the, the my memorial daughter down there. there. Yeah. Anyway, um, this massacre was led by Colonel uh, John Shimington, and um, it is remarked in numerous sources, or he makes the remark through numerous sources as to why they committed this massacre against these First Nations, and it's essentially because he argued nits make lice. Um, Shivington marched out of uh, Denver in 1864, um, and essentially he's inspired a little bit by a uh, by another uh, colonel's admission that uh, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. That's General Philip Sheridan. And the reason I'm using these quotes kind of a little bit out of context here is to kind of build this idea that in this case, it's the United States military. I mean, actually, before I even dig into this, what are your thoughts on those remarks? First and foremost, nits make lice. Let's let's break that down. Nick, what does nits make lice mean? So the thing that I always harp on when we discuss this in class is just the absolute dehumanization, um, the, the comparing these human beings and just minimizing them to the level of nits and lice, right? The second aspect of this very clearly is the idea that uh, nits grow into lice, right? So this is they're justifying the killing of children and the sterilization of women. Like we, if we were talking about the full episode, we would talk about how like they literally slaughtered these people and then just the atrocities that were committed there where they literally call, carved out the women's uteruses, put them on spikes, and paraded around, like, the area. Yeah, Shivington marches out, as I as I started to say, marches out of Denver in 1864, again, basically following the ideology outlined by General Philip Sheridan's chilling remark, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. That's, what, that's what's going to inform his behavior. They roll down into southeastern Colorado, as I kind of go through this relatively quickly, and he finds, like, an encampment, and that encampment is under the quote-unquote leadership if you listen to some of our episodes, like a full blown like leadership in Native American society isn't like how we make it out to be, you know. But regardless, it's more much more democratic than that. But regardless, Black Kettle is the one that is there, um, and the assumed leadership by the Americans on the lodge pole outside of this encampment. Uh, Black Kettle has um, both a white flag and an American flag like hoisted so that the United States military, again, this is the army, can see that. What does a white flag mean? Surrender. Or peace, right? Mm -hmm. And then the American flag clearly indicates what's Black Kettle trying to communicate here to Shivington. That he, yeah, I mean, they have accepted, they have surrendered, they want peace, they have accepted the flag of America, they are accepting assimilation at this point. Kane was able to find an amazing source here called the Shiving Shivington Massacre, and she quotes this, um, and this is from an eyewitness testimonial account at the time. She quotes this for effect, and I think it's a perfect choice by her. This is the quote. In going over the battleground the next day, I did not see a body of a man, woman, or child, but what was scalped, and in many instances, their bodies were mutilated in the most horrible manner. Men, women, and children's privates cut out... And I heard one man say that he had cut out a woman's private parts and had them for exhibition on a stick. I heard another man say that he had cut the finger off an Indian to get the rings on the hand, according to the best of my knowledge, and believe these atrocities that were committed were the knowledge of J.M. Shivington. Keep in mind, Shivington was put on trial in Denver, so these are the findings from the court case. So these are where these primary sources are coming from. And Nick kind of like, he, sum he summarized that quote before I said it. 
shame on you. But regardless, why is this important? Like, this is ritualization almost. Like, mm-hmm. the, the, these U.S. soldiers are cutting off the private parts, in this case of men and women, and parading yeah. them around. Yeah, just complete violation of the bodies of the indigenous peoples. Tying back to Kane's thesis, though, like, how mm-hmm. does that connect to Kane's thesis, that language informs basically our extermination behavior? Yeah, I mean, the language justifies in their own minds their behaviors because for them in theory like they're not dealing with human beings right this is a subspecies like this this idea of pseudo speciation these aren't human beings this is something else so it's okay for me to do this i'm not violating the body of a human this is something else which obviously is completely an atrocity and i just want to do like a short aside i know we don't want to go into sand creek like forever but many people would be like well that was just the thinking of the time so like shivington etc there were two other I don't care if they were generals or not, but military leaders that also were leading troops and they went with Shivington, but they both refused to send their troops and slaughter the people that were down by the creek. So this isn't a thing of the time. Like Shivington was completely out of line. He was even genocidal. At the time. Yeah, yeah, he was genocidal. 100%. Um, another quote uh, from the time period. This is a congressional witness uh, is quoted. His name is S.E. Brown. He credited Shivington with uttering the phrase, kill and scalp all little and big that knits made lice so again we have multiple witnesses assinuating that he said this i mean this is the justification for the killing of the women and the children specifically the children right because no matter how much like how ridiculous you might be like you don't just go in as a soldier and slaughter children like that's not part of warfare usually and even at the time it wasn't really a part of warfare but this is how they justify doing it against the indigenous peoples of the americas and it's not the first time in, in, in colonial history. One of the great things that, excuse me, uh, Katie Kane does here in this article is she ties it back to the, what she researched as the actual first time this idea that knits make lice was uttered. And it wasn't here in the United States. It was in Ireland when the British began their extermination campa- campaigns against Ireland. So this is hundreds of years before, obviously, but it happens at a, a massacre called Drogheda. And excuse my pronunciation. I don't, I don't actually even know what that, I mean, it's gotta be English, Gaelic. I, I don't know, but yeah, no regardless, idea. Celtic, I, I, but I'm not pronouncing it correctly, I bet. Regardless, the first time she uncovered that this was 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 said was by an English uh, uh, officer named Sir Charles Coote. And in poetic verse, for then uh, brave Sir Charles Coote, I honor who's in those father's steps so trod, as to the rebe- rebels was the scourge or rod of the Almighty, he, by good advice, did kill the nits that they may not grow lice. And again, that's poetic verse um, uh, to describe essentially, well, Oliver Cromwell's involved as well, but like what took place in Ireland at the time, that this Sir Charles Coote is going to go out and essentially annihilate these Irish rebels, these Irish rebels that are merely fighting for their freedom, their land, whatever, and it doesn't matter if they are actually like quote unquote insurgents or men or soldiers or whatever. It could be women. It could be children. It could be the elderly. They have to go um, for did kill the nits that they might not grow lice. And this is a perfect example of how sort of the lineage of this way of thinking, right? It's not just that Shivington was like inspired by this. He literally uses the exact same words. Like he quotes it word for word, according to the sources, as they're going into battle to slaughter these women and children. Absolutely. Um, as we go a little bit further into um, uh, Katie Kane's In fact, I want to correct that. They're not going into battle. There's, there's the, no yeah, battle. This is a it's a slaughtering. Yeah, this yeah. is a massacre. Um, Katie Kane go, does well to use one of the greatest sources of the 20th century on um, colonial language and extermination and all that stuff. She uses Franz Fanon um, and his study, his study, I don't even know if I call it a study. It's nah. just landmark uh, work, Wretched of the Earth. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not going to go through that. Franz Fanon deserves his own complete whole episode. Um, but regardless, she uses Fanon's theories to basically argue, and I, maybe I will quote a little bit here. Franz Fanon's- Actually, we'll link in the video. There's a super good um, Red Menace and Revolutionary Left Radio did a series. I can't remember if it's three or four parts where they dissect Wretched of the Earth fully. It's incredible. We'll link to that. In her use of Fanon, though, the reason she decides to cite him um, in relation to Nitz make lice is Franz Fanon's analysis in Wretched of the Earth of ge- geographic, political, and cultural de- divisions of the colonial world, uh, a colonial world as a world cut in two, confirms the centrality in settler state rhetoric of these metaphors and similes that 
uh, uh, analogize natives with the non-human. What does that mean? Let's let's like let, to be blunt. Let's dumb that down. Yeah, it's the idea of using the the language and like the term they use, the metaphors of dehumanizing these people to justify colonial atrocities. In this case, genocide and extermination and just outright slaughter. She quotes Fanon as saying. The native is declared insensible to ethics. He represents not only the absence of values, but also the negation of values. He is, let us dare to admit, the enemy of values. And in this sense, he is the absolute evil. He is the corrosive element destroying all that come near him. He is the deforming element, disfiguring all that he has to do with beauty or morality. He is the depository of malef maleficent powers, the unconscious and irretrievable instrument of blind forces. And we see this in language, whether we're going to be using it more as I go forward here into the boarding school era, or whether we see it in the way that immigrants are currently being discussed in the media or by the executive branch of the United States right now, we see this type of declaratory language, rapists and murderers or whatever. Like, I mean, yeah. this is what Any we're seeing. Any kind of symbolism and terminologies Absolutely. that you can use to sort of dehumanize, in this case, they're going into ethics and morals, which I love, to view them as immoral or amoral right? right and unethical and the, the term anti-american i mean it's just absolutely absurd but the power of language it's incredibly influential to justify people's ways of thinking that becomes genocidal the reason we, uh, uh, kane kind of references this idea of of what happens uh during the sand creek era and nits make lice is to also kind of move us forward into um the boarding school era and that's where we really want to go regarding like the conversation and connecting it to the recent uh investigation into what's happening in ice facilities is in this case it's not massacres there's nobody like there's no no to the best of my knowledge right now nobody's parading around like the 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 cities uh of the united states with genitals on sticks or anything along those lines what we're seeing is after the war was won getting back to what i talked about in the intro the war for the west was won it became a little bit more calm subdued form of ethnic cleansing or a more enlightened form of ethnic cleansing and this is where it's like we, we it's synthesized into a movement called eugenics real quick sociologist what's eugenics it's interesting there's two types of eugenics Positive eugenics is the idea that, uh, I guess eugenics in general is this idea that certain people have more superior genes and that we can control, through controlling who reproduces, in theory we could create like a more genetically superior society. I mean, just think of the Nazis and what they did is like the perfect example. Mm -hmm. Positive genetic genetics is promoting people with quote unquote superior genes to reproduce. Negative genetics is prohibiting people with inferior genes, quote unquote, from reproducing. Okay, and we see like the, again, softer form of this beginning as early as 1819. So now I'm going to read from boardingschoolhealing.org. So again, these are First Nation sources rather than me speaking on this. Beginning with the Indian Civilization Act uh, Fund of March 3rd of 1819 and the Peace Policy of 1869, the U.S., in concert with at the urging of several denominations of the Christian Church, adopted an Indian boarding school pol policy expressly intended to implement cultural genocide through the removal and reprogramming of American Indian and Alaska Native children to accomplish the systematic destruction of Native cultures and communities. The stated purpose of this policy was to kill the Indian, save the man. So, so far we're talking about like all of these catchphrases and quotes, and at first we have nits make lice, and then we have uh, kill them all big and small, or whatever Philip Sheridan said that, that kind of informed Shivington. Fine, but now it's a little bit nicer. Now it's just kill the Indian, save the man. What? What are they after here? I mean, it's still the same thing. Extermination and genocide you, through the controlling of their reproductive capacity. That's what it is. So the Native American part or the nativepartnership.org goes on to describe kill the Indian, save the man. At this juncture, it was felt that reservation schools were not sufficiently removed from the influences of tribal life. In the eyes of assimilationists, off-reservation boarding schools would be the best hope for changing Indian children into members of white society. For Colonel Richard Henry Pat, 
Pratt, the goal was complete assimilation. In 1879, he established the most well-known of the off-reservation boarding schools, the Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. As headmaster of the school for 25 years, he was the single most impacting figure in Indian education during this time. I want to pause and touch on a couple of elements here. First and foremost, this kill the Indian, save the man. What do we see between like Shivington and Sheridan and Sir Charles Coote in Ireland and now this Pratt guy? They all are affiliated with what they're all the military should military men have any say so at least in education program like what that's not what they're trained to do no what are they doing yeah it, it's absurd i mean they're trained to kill that's what they're trained to do it's out of control. His model, the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania, becomes the model for over like 350 boarding schools throughout the United States. And this was not optional for indigenous children. Mm -hmm. They were stolen from reservations. Again, that's breaking treaties. They are stolen from reservations from their families, literally kidnapped, disappeared, and taken most of the time against their parents' will to these schools to be forced into assimilation. And what do we mean by assimilation? Like, how do they go about that? Carlisle and other off-reservation boarding schools instituted their assault on native cultural identity by first doing away with all outward signs of tribal life that the children brought with them. Long braids worn by Indian boys were cut off. The children were made to wear standard uniforms. The children were given new white names, including surnames, as it was felt this would help the, uh, when they inherited property. Traditional native foods were abandoned, forcing students to acquire the food rights of white society, including the use of knives, forks, spoons, napkins, and tablecloths, etc 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 they are basically trying to just remove all native identity and practice well and, and then culture. again the importance of language all schools were taught in english and yes. use of their native language was absolutely prohibited it was not just prohibited if in some schools if you were caught using your your native language you were thrown in a ditch and mm -hmm. and left there for an undetermined amount of time in fact some of you may be familiar with in the current prison system something called the hole yep. the hole actually started in these boarding schools before it started in these federal prisons there's literally a hole in the ground i mind-boggling mm -hmm. mind-boggling how this history is just so just it is it's it's i mean and there's stories like this was quite common that when the children were stolen from their parents the parents would go set up camp outside of the school just so they could be physically near them and they never would see them again yeah, I mean, I I was first introduced to this idea way way back in undergraduate studies in, in, in Fort Collins when I when I actually read a novel. It was a novel, but it was a novel um, written to kind of like describe the experience of this assimilation process. It, and I got to give a shout out to it because it's the book that kind of introduced me to this a, a lot longer ago than I'm willing to admit. <laughs> um, it's a book called Wind from Enemy, uh, Enemy Sky by D.R.C. McNichol. We'll try and link it in like the show notes or something, but it's an amazing book. And again, it is a novel. It is a fiction. I must stress that, but written in a way that is meant to just introduce the ideas of this... This, this changing dynamic that so many First Nation people felt just on the outskirts of where they were supposedly safe to live now. Like, mm -hmm. that's what it was about. Um, anyway, okay, so we have these boarding schools, and we've talked about the cultural, um, uh, basically, attack on them, but we haven't got to, like, the main, like, uh, reason we're doing this episode right now. At some point, it's not just enough to steal the children that already are alive and put them in these schools and then strip them of their identity, um, basically in this, this, this prison, for lack of a better term. But eventually, they started to, especially with the young girls, sterilize them. Um, from Mary Bravebird here, a Lakota woman, and this is quoted by Katie Kane in her article again. After my, so uh, my sister Sandra was born, the doctors performed a hysterectomy on my mother, in fact sterilizing her without her permission, which was common at the time and up to just a few years ago, so that it is hardly worth mentioning. In my opinion of some people, the fewer Indians there are, the better, as Colonel Shivington said to his soldiers, kill them all, big and small, nits make lice. I don't know whether I am a louse under the white man's skin. I hope I am. It's one quote. It's powerful. What do we make of this? I mean, yeah, this is just one example of the forced sterilization of the indigenous women that took, I mean, it's still taking place to this day, but this is so common back during this era, I mean, into the 20th century. Right. And when we say this era, we're talking basically from the boarding schools, the beginning of the Carlisle School in the 1870s through, let me be blunt, the 1970s. In fact, let's talk about the, the 1970s. Yeah, on a global scale, 
like we just talked about eugenics, right? So on a global scale, the, the eugenics movement was taking off, inspired by Charles Darwin's ideas and so on. Not that he was ever really like promoting these ideas, but... It was like Herbert Spencer's social Darwinism, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah. Although at least he was only focused really on... Yeah, whatever. That's a whole thing. He Herbert wasn't, Spencer's fo- he wasn't thing. focused on genocide. It was yeah, more like, exactly. like the, the, the rich social, and poor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That could be its. We'll do a whole episode on Herbert Spencer <laughs> yeah. someday too. Okay, uh, not nearly as heartbreaking, but still kind of heartbreaking. Yeah. Oh god. So let's just fast forward to 1907, which is when Indiana enacted America's first compulsory eugenic sterilization law. That's literally what it was called, the compulsory eugenic sterilization law in 1907 in Indiana. Prior to this time. The governments were still sterilizing people, but it was only done as a punishment. So if you committed a crime or something, and we're not talking about just like indigenous peoples at this point, this is everyone. Um, So in 1907, Indiana enacts this first law. 15 other states enacted similar laws during the following two decades. Most of these laws were eventually declared unconstitutional, like you might imagine. Um, However, in 1927, there was a famous case called Buck versus bull upheld in Virginia that upheld Virginia's CES law, the eugenic sterilization law. And I have this case highlighted because A, it's hugely influential, but B, there's a quote in the decision by the judge who is a Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. And his quote gives you everything you need to know about the sentiment of this time. And again, it's Can language. we pause for a second? Yeah. Oliver Wendell Holmes has a middle school named after him less than like 10 minutes from here exactly holmes middle school yeah disgusting this is his quote it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for a crime or to let them starve for their imbecility society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind this is his quote to support uh, virginia's compulsory eugenic sterilization law in 1927 We're going to fast forward through a bunch of this history and take us up to 1970, which is what Jared is talking about. Well, yeah, even before. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, I have another good quote here, but keep going. Yeah. like I want to stress that this sentiment carries through from the early 1900s to 1927 with Holmes' decision up until 1970 when the Senate approves the Family Planning Act of 1970, which gets approved overwhelmingly by the Senate vote. Part of this sentiment of the Family Planning Act is birth control, and part of it is compulsory birth control for certain portions of the population, because the idea is that this is how we can control crime, and there's this huge fear at the time that the population is getting out of control, and that we have to figure out how to keep the population from growing out of hand so that we can still support everyone that lives within the borders of the United States, which is completely absolutely ridiculous sterilization for women increased 350 percent between 1970 and 1975 approximately 1 million american women were sterilized each year between 1970 and 1975 eventually a series of lawsuits lead to uh, there's tons of lawsuits about this eventually against governments against facilities that are performing these procedures and so on finally the government conducts a study specifically related to indigenous women and what's going on and it's albuquerque phoenix oklahoma city and south dakota they analyze the facilities there i'm using this because it gives us a statistic that we is really really powerful They found that between 1973 and 1976, Indian Health Service facilities sterilized 3,406 Native American women. Now, someone out there is saying, like, that doesn't sound like a lot, 3,406, which itself is an egregious statement, and you should go, like, whatever. But at the time— It's more than whatever, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be a whole episode if we went there. Right. At the time, there were only 100,000 women— Native American women that were that were childbearing. So if we do the numbers, which they did in this report, it is the equivalent of the forced sterilization of 452,000 non-Native women. This is an example, uh, and this is all under the guise of the U.S. government. This is an example of how these policies and these ideologies continue into the 1970s, where they're still trying to force the eradication of the indigenous people through the controlling of the reproductive power and 
this the the idea that nits make lice. If they can just stop them from reproducing, they will cease to exist. And I mean, we can go further and further with this, but I, I'm going to kind of keep us moving forward now. I think Nick really just nailed that section. I mean, through the 1970s, once things kind of like become more apparent and again, the United States attempts a little bit more softer form of, of colonial ethnic cleansing against First Nation women here, um, we have a different approach actually after the boarding schools slowly but surely die down through the mid 20th century until that last quarter of the 20th century, they slowly but surely start to go away. Um, but the United States need to quote unquote, kill the Indian, uh, and save the man did not go with those schools. Instead, they decided to create the adoption act of 1958, where it was heavily promoted that white families would take instead of, instead of the boarding schools, white families would adopt the indigenous children and raise them as their own white children. So the children are still being taken from their indigenous homes often against their will, and put into, to be blunt, white suburbia to be raised as like these, um, I, I don't even know, good little like American citizens, good little what, whatever we want to call them. Oftentimes it was heavily Protestant informed as well, so there was a lot of, a lot of religious um, overtones uh, yeah, that, that were kind of forced upon these indigenous kids, which isn't new necessarily to the 20th century. We can go back through the, col- the entire colonial process from Catholic missions all the way through um, praying towns in, in uh, Massachusetts and so on and so forth. But regardless, these religious overtones inform a lot of these white families to basically rationalize that they're saving these children exactly. from more or less their... They would not use the term savage anymore, let's mm-hmm. say, but like heathen, perhaps. their heathen exactly. parents and their heathen culture. And I must stress that this starts in 1958, but it's not done. There's still currently Native American children right now being adopted into like white families, usually against the their, their better interests. In fact, now we're going to shout out a, a much more famous channel than ours, Vox in this case. Vox has an amazing video that you'll be able to see somewhere on your screen at this point, wherever, as maybe the next video can, you can watch. But the video is titled, How the U.S. Stole Thousands of Native American Children. And it goes a little bit through into the history of the boarding schools, and it's probably going to be a shorter video than ours. But regardless, most importantly, it actually interviews people that went through this system, grown Mm -hmm. adults that went through this adoption or fostering system that were taken from their families and raised in these white families and told everything they are sucks and that they need to change who they are. This is powerful. This is powerful. This is, I mean, it's kidnapping. Mm -hmm. And it is just, again, I mean, where does this fit on like the, the, uh, the process we're talking about of nits making lice? Does it fit still? Like, what do you think? Yeah. Like, I just want to sum up what you said, just so everyone's crystal clear. Once people figured out what was going on in the boarding schools and they became just too absurd for even people of the time to handle, they were eventually phased out. So instead, they literally just took children from their indigenous families and sold them to white families so they would be assimilated into American society just to skip the whole boarding school step because people are no longer accepted. Well, that. boarding schools were expensive too. and uh, No, that's yeah, exactly right. That's right. what they talk about. Yeah. Like... One of the motivations for doing this was that the adoption policy was cheaper than maintaining the boarding schools, right? So it's about finances too. But this is just an evolution of the extermination of the indigenous culture. And it eliminates future generations, right? Not only does it like eliminate the culture itself, it eliminates by assimilating these people into white society it's eliminating the reproductive capacity of the indigenous right. people, just Even, like we're talking yeah, about. It might not be a forced hysterectomy anymore, but odds are that person will then meet likely a white partner. And yeah. slowly but surely, the bloodline will be purified. Um, and and right. it's sad and it's gross for me to say that out loud, but that's what these people believe. That's what they fucking believe. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, we're, we're a little bit all over the place today because this is a very important topic. Um, and it's it's absolutely appalling. So, yeah, it's... Yeah. Um, okay, so moving from sterilization through the 70s, through the adoption process, which again is still taking place right now, let's transition. Now, we're not necessarily fully talking about like the indigenous communities that we're used to talking about, but a lot of the Im- immigrants coming to the United States are indigenous. Now, not indigenous, perhaps like Cheyenne or Sioux or, you know, whatever, Wampanoag or Mohawk or any of these that we've been talking about in our Myth is America series, but still indigenous, right? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we the whole goal of this episode was to 
contextualize the current event that's happening right now so people can understand that like much of what we've been talking about lately this isn't an isolated case they're destroying the immigrant family they're separating the kids from the parents these kids are being held in cages in basically prisons and now now we have accusations of sterilization yeah this is no like the United States is built on this. This I is cannot not novel. stress enough. Exactly. This isn't like, I mean, it's disgusting enough, even if it was an isolated incident that had just happened. But think about how this is, this, there's a long history of this in the United States. The United States as a colonial project is built upon this way of thinking and this way of behaving and just the absolute relentless violation of the indigenous body, just in so many different ways, from slaughtering to the cutting of the hair you mentioned and the forcing of the clothes and the eradication of the language to the forced hysterectomies to the killing of the children to the, I mean, and so on. It just goes on and on and on and now we are just faced with one more example of this happening under the control of the united states government in an ice facility in georgia and probably in other places where these women who are not white are being forced to undergo hysterectomies and be sterilized so coming back to part of the at least academic inspiration for this episode that has been a little bit more fired up than some of our other episodes and for good reason um why are we all just sitting around and cool with it based on Kane's theory here of, uh, of language and it's make lice. What, what, wh- why is this happening? And we're just here. Like, I, I cannot stress this enough. There are children in cages. There's children in cages. There's, ch- there's children in cages. We, it's ideology. I mean, it's, it's, it's the language. It still exists to this day. We listen to what the media spews. We listen to what the leadership of this country spews and the employees at the facility themselves. I mean, all down the chain, all of this language and all this way of behaving, this American exceptionalism and so on, makes a vast majority of the population think that this is okay and it absolutely dehumanizes those people. Like you've seen the memes, right? Why don't we tell the white people that it's dogs in cages? Then they'll freak out. That's true because the people are so dehumanized, right? We view them as animals and so everyone's like okay with it. You don't view a child sitting in that cage or a woman being uh, sterilized, right? You don't view it as your own child, right? These are people that exist somewhere else that are something else. And that's how sort of the mental gymnastics that are forced to take place to right. commit I'm this, not, this And behavior. mental gymnastics is correct because we're not going to enter into this discussion of pro-life versus pro-choice. That's not what this episode is about. But for those of you out there that do uh, kind of lean towards the pro-life or call yourself pro-life, where are you at? Where are you at on this topic? Exactly. Where are you at? Forced hysterectomies, children in cages. Where are you? Mental gymnastics. All right. I think that's going to close it out for this episode. If you have thoughts, uh, leave us a comment or contact us. You can find us on revolutionandideology.com, on Twitter at Rev and Ideology. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Later.